Yeah, so let me just take a poll real quick. Did people get to, um, who here was able to listen to Jeff Steinberg's Thursday Night Report? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, a number of people were. And was anyone here able to see the webcast of last night? Okay, great. Okay, so it looks like a handful of people. All right, let me say at the outset just that now's the proper time to get yourself programmed to get to get to these webcasts on Friday nights because remember that Lyndon, of course, he was recovering from a couple of minor surgeries for a while, and so he was not running the webcasts entirely for uh, you know several weeks there. I guess maybe five weeks, and uh, now Lyndon is back in the driver's seat for these webcasts. So that last night was the first webcast in a long time where it was just Lyndon responding to questions that were being asked to him by Matt Ogden and Ben Deniston. So it's a good time to get yourself back in the habit of watching these things at 8 p.m. Or everyone here knows the conference code, the conference call line. You can call in on Friday night at 8 p.m. and listen to it live by your telephone if you don't if you're not planning to use the computer. So in other well, words, just like Thursday night you call use the, the access code? Same access code, same story in time. But you don't need the uh, but you have to It's like the, it's just like a thousand number, don't you? Yes, yeah, exactly. You call the four two four number, you put in the same access code from Thursday night, okay. but of course the activist call is at nine PM whereas the webcast is at eight PM. Yeah. So I just want to make that request that people, well, urge you to. And if you need it, I'll definitely put it on the board before we leave. I think everyone's, everyone's probably gotten it from us 18 times, but. All right. Yeah, that's right, that's right. No reason not to. No reason not to. Anyway, okay, so um, I, I, I really like this, this setup, this question of um, what is it that, uh, um, what is it that your principled actions can do into the future? And what defines a principled action? What is a creative action? How can you actually create the future? Okay, that's what Kuza was talking about. That's what he was thinking about. That's what his life was about. That's what he did. Uh, I've done two classes on Kuza. One of them was the one I did most recently where I had all the Aristotle quotes. If people were here for that, I think you know, I guess the good one no, uh, the other one was, uh, the first one I did, I started with the map, and I showed his whole, uh, the first half of his life, up to about 1440. People remember that, and I was talking about the Turks, and I was talking about the, uh, the Venetians, and so forth. It was in that spot on the Lower East Side, or not Lower East Side, but um, you know, it was like Murray Hill kind of area. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I, on that day, I only got through about half of Kuz's life. Today I'm going to finish the second half of Kuz's life. And I want it to be used, you know, I want you to think about it from the standpoint of this new situation that we're in. Because you kind of have to drop everything that you thought about this movement. You kind of have to stop it, stop thinking that way. And I mean it from this standpoint. We have been, imagine, imagine those of you who signed up with us uh, under Bush, for example. Imagine what we were doing. We were calling out to people, hello, the system's about to blow. Hello, you know, look at how bad we're collapsing. And mostly what you ran into was people walking around in a day saying, what? The economy's doing fine. Or, you know, what? You know, like, you know, I know things are bad, but they're not that bad. Right? Okay. All right. <laughs> and that's just symptomatic of what we were doing, what we've been doing for 50 years since the assassination of John Kennedy, which is to say, stopping doing everything possible to stop a collapse. Okay? So we're kind of like pushing, no, stop. We're trying to wake people up. Hey, we're falling, in, yeah, yeah, we're falling into the, right, into the pit. Wake up. Things are different now. Things are massively different now because the world is being born. The new world is being born. We're in the birth pangs right now. The new world economic order is defined by the BRICS 
It's defined by China, it's defined by Russia, most importantly it's defined by Lin. Okay? This is happening. And it's happening quickly, so it's easy to miss it. But it's happening. Return to the Egypt question. August 5th, Al-Sisi gives a press conference. We're going to double the size of the Suez Canal. This had been discussed before. But he says, we're going to do it. And then he says, you know, we, 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 originally we thought this was going to take us three years. Well, I've decided we're going to do it in one year. Ooh. And like, like Scott said, within a week, you have 7,000 people working on it. That's quick, right? That is really quick. That is incredibly quick. You're talking about taking a canal that's been around for over 100 years and finally expanding it. That's incredible. Okay, so just consider that. It's happening right now. If you listen to what Cristina Fernandez has been saying, she should be shot for all of these things. You would, in other words, what I mean is, you would expect to yourself, only someone who was ready to be assassinated would say those things out loud. <laughs> She's really begging for a bullet to be put through her head British, yeah. from the British, right? But she's doing it. I remember a year ago when we were doing a bunch of the stuff on Kennedy, and I was reading Kennedy's speeches and I was saying, oh my god, I had no idea he said this. I can't believe that he attacked Malthus in a speech about science. He said that, he said that environmentalism was crap. Oh my god, of course they killed him. There was, he said two months before, before he was killed that we should turn the space program into a collaborative effort, a collaborative effort with Russia, with the Soviet Union. <laughs> of course he's, that's incredible, I can't even believe he said that. And, okay, the same, same feeling that you have about that is what you should be having about what these, what these presidents are saying, what these people are saying. Let me make the point by playing a little bit from the webcast last night. I'm going to play one question and answer. Uh, is, I know that's small. Is that high enough for people to see? Yeah, I'll put it, I'll put it on the boat. This question has comments from um, the Vice President of Bolivia. I think his name is Linera. Okay, keep in mind the context. For decades now, Bolivia has been a discuss, you know, I mean, they've been taken over by environmentalists. They've been taken over by the Greenies, by the Ga Gaia, Mother Earth. Okay, that's where they've been for decades. They've been in backwards. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that in that part of South America, the environmentalist tendency is very strong. But okay. this book, How That's Frank, um, I forget the name of the guy who wrote it. It's called uh, uh, Confessions of a Economic, economic hitman. Economic hitman. Yeah. Perkins. Huh? Perkins. Perkins. John Perkins. John Perkins. Describes what they did. South yeah. America. Yeah, Bolivia has been destroyed by the IMF, by the World Bank, by the World, by the uh, British Empire. But part of the, what I'm trying to set you up. What I'm trying to set you up for is that the vice president said some, some remarkable things this week, and they go completely against what Bolivia had been saying in recent decades. So listen to this. Oh. On some recent remarks of the Vice President of Bolivia, who, um, uh, just to set up the context for his remarks, you've been stressing that China is taking the lead in developing high energy flux density, setting the standard for the world today, for mankind. 
and that any nation that wants to survive has to go by China's lead on this issue. Um, and this was very clearly reflected in the remarks of vice, the Vice President of Bolivia we made yesterday, where he explicitly invoked the concept of Prometheus. Why not? And Prometheus is fire in announcing Bolivia's decision to go further ahead with nuclear power. Um, this comes in the wake of uh, the context of meetings between uh, Putin and the president of uh, Bolivia, uh, the sidelines of the BRICS summit recently, and also meeting with uh, the president of China recently. But uh, Vice President uh, Linera Garcia of Bolivia had the following to say yesterday. Here's excerpts from his speech. He said, nuclear power is the fire of the 20th and 21st centuries. It is the fire which our ancestors had 20,000 years ago, which allowed them to make philosophy, technical science, culture, and agriculture. Knowledge of the atom, its regularities, its use, its functioning, is the touchstone of the 20th and 21st centuries. The fundamental core of new knowledge and new technologies, new theories, and new means of production. Bolivia cannot remain on the periphery if this is the case. If knowledge of the atom is the sacred fire of the 20th and 21st centuries, as fire was for the pre-agriculture civilizations of 20,000 years ago. Today, a society which is respected, and we respect ourselves, cannot remain on the periphery, and we are not going to remain on the periphery. Let us break the mental and colonial chains, break them. Let us dare to leave the cave as our ancestors did 20,000 years ago. Let us dare to assume our responsibility before the world, before our history and our society. Knowledge of nuclear energy is, is knowledge of the ABCs of nature. We have the technical, scientific, and moral obligation to take responsibility for the knowledge, use, understanding, and beneficial development of this fundamental force of nature. It doesn't matter how long it takes. We are going to do it because we are convinced that that is how we cement the conditions for the technological development of Bolivians for the next four to five hundred years. So in line with your remarks, I would like okay. to Okay, very, sim very simply stated. There is the history of Prometheus, and Prometheus was an actual person. How, how, what form he was an actual person, we're not always quite sure. But the point was that he, that is the case. All right, Prometheus is the principle, and that's the way to look at it. Prometheus is the exp expression of Prometheus. The expression of it. And that's what the difference is between mankind and everything else in the universe. So I just wanted to show that. First of all, to show you what, how excited Lynn is on, about what's going on here. He has every reason to be. But imagine that the Vice President of Bolivia is saying, is talking about Prometheus. Mm -hmm. And when he's talking about Prometheus, he's talking about nuclear power. So what is the potential of the BRICS nations coming together? It's that figures, heads of state in South America, all of a sudden, are talking like LaRouche. If Cristina Fernandez has been talking like John Kennedy, then that guy, Linero Garcia, was definitely talking like LaRouche. So what I'm saying is, this is already happening. And that's a big psychological shift. Your identity may have been, up to this point, stop the collapse. Just hold off the collapse. We can, you know, if we get things realigned, we can do, do something about this. What I'm saying is the difference now is that the new system is coming into being. 
It is being born as we speak. We have created a mass movement, a global coalition. Imagine in your mind what is happening. If he's saying that, and she is saying what she is saying, President Xi, that is, if Modi is saying what Modi is saying, then they're, they're not just saying that to, like, for us to pick up and print an EIR. I mean, of course, it's not being published, it's not being published in the Post, in the it's Times. not being published in the Times, right? Yeah. So they're not just saying that for our benefit. They're speaking to their people. They're speaking to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of young people. And as this concept of creativity, of fire, of Promethean fire, the principle, LaRouche is saying, of Prometheus, is the leading concept of statecraft in the world defined by the BRICS, then you, I have in my mind an image of a globe, like when you see the, the Earth from space at night. And as the world is turning, you see the lights from the cities across the world are sparkling, right? And they gradually light up across the whole, the whole globe. And you can see that, that 3D image, right? Everyone's seen something like that before. Yeah. Imagine that in your mind, but every single one of those lights is the mind of a young person that has all of a sudden been sparked into existence because of this strategic alliance that is now taking place. It's happening now. It's happened in the past six weeks. It's happening now. Rapid shift. So take that into your heart. Take that into your mind for a moment. That's the new strategic situation. The world is defined by the miracle of creativity that is currently taking place across the world. So when you ask yourself, do we have enough power to do what we need to do? Do we have the means to accomplish what we need to accomplish? Forget it. Forget it. We have an almost unlimited resource in the creativity being sparked by those young people, in those young people across the world. All right? Therefore, the problem that we must commit ourselves to of taking care of the U.S. government becomes of a slightly different nature. It becomes something where people who are thinking strategically are aligning themselves, they have a choice. Continue with make-believe or live in reality. And key strategic thinkers in the United States, specifically as Scott referenced in the retired military and the retired intelligence, are beginning to say to themselves and say directly to Jeff as a conduit to Lynn, my God, LaRouche has got it. This is it. Helium-3, that's the way. Key bankers in Texas, and I expect that this is related to the Federal Reserve System, have positioned themselves strategically on the basis of the reality that the value system defined by the Wall Street dollar is no longer significant. And that any value system today derives its value relative to the Chinese helium-3 fusion lunar program. The only way to judge the value of what your economy is doing is by looking at the Chinese and seeing how your plan is compared to theirs. That's how the new system of value works. It's by, and as, as Scott ended with, you, it means you have to figure out what are the big questions we haven't been asking yet. What new questions arise from this? So consider that as sort of like the unfolding reality today. And I want to give you the deeper historical understanding of how we came here and how it could be that ideas move history and not what we were taught in school which is that, you know, a handful of people decide history, or mass movements decide history, whatever. No, it's ideas, okay? Nicholas of Cusa. Everyone here has gotten some amount of Cusa from me. I hope. 
This is not, I'm certainly from the organization. This is not going to take, oops. This is not going to be a particularly long presentation. I'm going to keep it brief. We just passed an incredible milestone on August 11th. August 11th, 2014, was the 550th anniversary of the death of Nicholas of Cusa. 550 years ago, on August 11th, he died on the road to Ancona, from which is on the um, it's on the eastern coast of uh, of Italy from Rome. He died about halfway in between Rome on the western coast and, and uh, Ancona on the eastern coast in a small city called Todi, T-O-D-I, on August 11th. Okay? This is a story of Cusa's death. That's what I'm going to tell you today. These are illuminated manuscripts, and this is even in his hand. This is, this is a letter that Nicholas of Cusa wrote. It's small, so it's not like you can see the details, but it's just an example of what people would see if you were studying Cusa in the 1440s, in the 1450s, the 1460s, which people were. He was extremely famous in educated circles as a strategic thinker, as a theological thinker, as a scientific thinker, as a man, as a, as a scientist, as a thinker. When I left off last was on De Docta Ignorantia, published in 1440, his most important work. I'm going to rewind just a little bit. Cusa created the modern nation state as an idea. He did so in 1433 at the Council of Basel with his publication of Concordantia Catholica, the Catholic Concordance. He says, since natural law is based on reason, all law by nature is rooted in the reason of man. This is a new conception of natural law. The last great thinker on natural law before Cusa is St. Augustine in 480. This is a new conception of natural law, a thousand years after Augustine. Since natural law is based on reason, all law by nature is rooted in the reason of man. This is the beginning principle of any idea that man can govern himself. That there's such a thing as self-governance. That's the beginning of an idea of a nation state. If man's mind is in the image, is the living image of God's mind, then man can understand natural law. Because it's based on reason, and man's mind is, is defined by its own reason. Later he says, there is in the people a divine seed by virtue of their common equal birth and the equal natural rights of all men so that all authority which comes from man at, excuse me, which comes from God authority comes from God as does man himself all authority is recognized as divine when it arises from the common consent of the people, of all the subjects. He's defining an idea of a government, a divine government. It's not a theocracy. That's not the point. He doesn't say what defines a, a, divine, a divine government is, is that, you know, is that it's made up of priests or that it's made up of people who are practicing. Yeah, he doesn't say it's the king or the queen who's been anointed by God. He doesn't even say that it's supposed to, it has to be a Christian. Uh, that it has to be Christian. He doesn't say that. He says what makes it divine is that it comes from the common, is that there's the, 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 the authority arises from the common consent of the subjects. This is wild. 
This is wild. Other people have talked about similar concepts in the centuries before. He is deploying this idea into the most important council of church fathers and representatives that has ever happened at the Council of Basel. We won't really know later, until later, that this is the case. And then, of course, the Council of Florence is exceedingly more important. This is that divinely ordained marital state of spiritual union based on a lasting harmony by which a commonwealth is guided in the fullness of peace toward eternal bliss. So remember this, he's, he's, tell, he's talking about this in the time of the Holy Roman Empire, the Venetian Empire, he's talking about this in the time of the Ottoman Empire, he's talking about this in the time period where, you know, what does he have in terms of uh, good examples? He has Athens, ancient Athens, and he has Florence, the Republic of Florence. And he's saying, this is, but he's come up with his own new conception. Here, I'm going to actually go ahead and pass that, although it's fun to look at the pictures. Here is what Helga Zeppelin had to say about this. I want you to think, when you're, when you're reading this, think about the fact that she was, her, an interview with Helga Zeppelin was published in a variety of Chinese media this week because of an interview she did with Xinhua, the Chinese state media the state media, in which she said that the new Silk Road is a policy for world peace. It's the only option. Here's what she says about Nicholas of Cusa and uh, the Catholic Concordance. Even if the significance of the union of the churches over the issue of filioque is undervalued by the majority of our contemporaries, they are at the very heart of the values of our Christian humanist culture and the values of the Christian West. The union of the churches over the filioque that Cusa established at the Council of Florence comes after the Council of Basel. The Council of Florence is in the late, in the late 1430s, 1438, 1439. He's the one who organizes it. Remember, this was in my last class. Cusa goes to Constantinople. He gets, I guess I do have to use these pictures. He goes to Constantinople uh, because the Pope sends him there. Cusa says, we're going to reunite the Eastern and Western churches, the Orthodox Church and the Roman Church. They've been separate for 400 years because the Roman Catholic Church says that the, divine, that the Holy Spirit comes from not just God, not just the Father, but the Son. But the, uh, the uh, Orthodox Church says that it comes only from the Father. The significance of this is that if you, believe, if you don't believe that the Holy Spirit can come from the Son, then you cannot see man as a co-creator, as divine. That was the inheritor, or the, the next in line. If you can't see mankind as being creative, then I don't think you can agree with this. If you don't see mankind as creative, I don't think you can ever believe in self-governance, self-government. I don't think you can go agree with this. Because you could never think of a, a divine government of man. You know, think about the fundamentalists you talk to who say, well, the world is evil. Satan rules this world. There's nothing you can do about it. All right? If you believe that, then you don't believe in the creative capabilities of mankind. And the equivalent is to say, the Holy Spirit comes only from the Father, and we're down here. Kuza united the Eastern and Western churches around the idea, no, the Holy Spirit comes from God and His Son, the man God, Christ. So Kuza went to Constantinople. He organized the Emperor of Byzantine. He organized the Patriarch of Constantinople. This is a guy named Platon, who was... Uh, who sparked the, he was a leading uh, secular Plato scholar, 
he sparked the uh, Platonic Academy, Academy that arose in Florence. Incredible scholar. He brought these guys back along with 700 other people from Constantinople. He brought them back to Venice, and then he <laughs> brought them, effectively, he got, he got them to the Council of Florence. He got them there. On the way, over the course of this, he, 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 he recruited them to this idea that they had rejected, that their, their church had rejected for 400 years. Cusa recruited them to this idea. He got them to, to uh, agree, he got them to agree that their own church fathers had been heretics. Her heretics, whatever. Mm -hmm. He got them to agree that, that, that they had been wrong for 400 years. Talk about organizing. I have in my mind this Bolivian vice president who instead of saying we have to listen to Mother Nature and to Gaia says we need Prometheus. We've been wrong. Cusa does this. It's absolutely incredible. He brings them back this long voyage. On that voyage he's on a big ship. A galley. I had a picture of it at one point what, the, what it might have looked like. But he's on, he's, you know, there's a whole bunch of these ships going because they've got 700 people they're bringing. And, and, he, and he's, he's on the ocean between Constantinople, coming down up around, around Greece, up towards Venice. And he has a vision. He has a vision from the Divine Father of Lights, is what he calls it. That's what he says. And it's a vision about how to understand the incomprehensible. Incomprehensible. It's a vision about how to, how to deal with paradoxes. How to seek truth when you know that you can never know truth. The truth is something that is infinite, and man's mind is finite. So you're never really going to, you're not going to cram that in here. Okay, so he has a vision. He writes De Dr. Ignorantia. But the point, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I got a little bit off track, but the point here is he created the union of the churches over this question of the filioque. Is that clear, the, what, I, what I mean by the filioque? Latin, in Latin, filioque means and the Son. So the Holy Spirit flows not just from the Father, but and the, from the Son. Okay, so he got them, he got them to change these 400 years and agree to this. Helga says, if we lose this knowledge, we will also lose what is most precious, that which is at the basis of our conception of mankind. The emergence of Christianity marks the greatest turning point in human history. By becoming man, Christ broke the cyclical image of history, which had been the leading feature of pagan, pre-Christian myths and cults. With Christ, who was at the same time man and God, man made in the image and likeness of God, became capax dei, that is, capable of participating in God, and thus capable of infinitely increasing self-perfection and approach to God. We're not, we're not just worms. We're not just worms crawling around on the earth and there's nothing we can do. We're just so infinitely lower than God. No. We are capable of increasing self-perfection and approach to God. Only with the Son of God who becomes man, with the passion and resurrection, was man's redemption made possible. God's capacity to become man and man's capacity to participate directly in God is the basis of the inalienable dignity of every man. No other monotheistic religion believes that God has become man. What Christianity allows man is his liberation, his freedom through necessity. For Cusa, Christ gives meaning to the universe, and his followers are those who give meaning to man. Thus he writes in the beautiful sermon, Confide My Daughter, of 1444, let us seek in ourselves what Christ is. If we do not find him in ourselves, then we will not find him at all. 
Then he continues with the following observation. Until such time as man reaches life in his own humanity, the true cause of every life, in truth, cause of all, let me start over. Until such time as man reaches life in his own humanity, the true cause of every life, in truth, cause of all that is true and acceptable, and in the good, cause of all that is good and to which it is right to aspire, he will never reach his aim. He will never have peace. How true, says Helen, and how right it is to affirm that the root of all unhappiness for those who today hastily and restlessly chase after pleasure lies in the fact that they believe they can realize their own humanity in some way other than by seeking Christ within themselves. I hope I've made it pretty clear what, what we mean by this. I'm not... Anyway, yes. Okay. Allow me to continue with Kuz's life. Now that you see that he has created the basis in his theology, in his political organizing, for the modern nation state. Does the modern nation state exist yet? No way. Not even close. But he created it. So this is a paradox, right? Here are two of the popes that he dealt with. For <laughs> two <laughs> making me laugh, Jessica. This is uh, uh, Pope uh, Nicholas V, whose name before he became Pope Nicholas V was Tommaso Parenticelli, uh, 1447 to 1455. This is a guy who I, I think is a riot, who's uh, Aeneas Piccolomini. I think a very conflicted guy, interesting. But these are two key figures in the end of Cusa's life, because Cusa lives to, and as, as I told you, we're at the 550th anniversary of his death, August 11th. So Cusa dies August 11th, 1464. He dies three, di three days before Piccolomini dies. Piccolomini dies three days, three days after him. They're very much working together. Cusa, in the latter part of his life, is selected by Piccolomini to run all of Rome while the, while the Pope is out of town. Piccolomini is in the process of trying to organize a crusade against the Turks. <laughs> because the Turks are encroaching in Europe. And he believes we're going to have to have a war. Cusa doesn't think that way, but you'll see what he, he does. But Piccolomini, I mean, he's a, a, essentially a well-meaning guy. I mean, he's not a bad pope, but he's, a, he's not a genius, I think. I, think. I, I don't have any right, really, to say these things, because I'm not an expert on this guy. But this is, this is re merely my lay opinion, OK? So um, but anyway, he, he chooses Cusa to be his right-hand man. And, and I believe it's in it was one of these two, at some point, the, the election of this one or that one, Cusa got votes to be pope. He could have become pope. He was, he was, you know, was he got votes in the process. All right, so these are two guys that he's going to deal with. Actually, it's the pope immediately before him. I have my pictures a little bit out of order. Who sends Cusa on a trip to Germany, and he's supposed to. It's uh, it's actually it's Eugenius, I guess. Eugene, yeah, he goes, he, he goes to Germany, and Cusa goes on this massive tour of Germany. He does this incredible long tour. I'm going to pull up the, uh, the map, because it's really fun. He, he does this remarkable tour of all of Germany. And not just Germany, but also uh, the Netherlands and basically modern-day Belgium and stuff. Um, he made it to the He did not make it to Lower Manhattan. <laughs> no. I wish. I wish. Okay, but let me show you on the map here. This is this is pretty cool. Okay, here we go. It's loading up. All right. So these are all the different locations in his life, but now I'm going to switch. 
I have two layers here. This is his German reform tour. In the space of effectively 18 months, he travels from Rome up here to modern day Austria. He goes around Austria. He goes up. He goes over. He goes all in here. He goes all the way up here. He goes up, 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 back, back down. And he ends up uh, back here. And uh, imagine what that is. I mean, you're, you're walking. In those days? Oh my yeah, in, yeah, you're talking in the 1440s. Uh, 14, 1450s at this point. How far could they go with the horse and wagon? I honestly don't know. I know it would have been extraordinarily difficult. Mountainous regions, too. Yeah, right. They're going through. I got some good photos. Yeah, let's see. Those are the Alps. You can't take a horse and carriage through those. Yeah, right. So you're doing. A lot of walking. Okay, here's. Well, I haven't. I have some nice photos of there, I'll show you later, but the point is, he's doing an incredible amount of traveling. I mean, like an incredible amount. And he has this, and he says, okay, I'm going to go into Germany. He's already done a mission in Germany before, which was really incredible, where he got the German princes and bishops basically to side with the Pope. He's done that. And so he's done already incredible work, but now he goes into Germany and says, I'm going to do a reform mission. And, uh, and so he goes to these towns. And he'll spend two weeks here, or three days there, or five days there, or whatever. And he goes all the way around, and, uh, and he starts working on a project that's basically nation building in Germany. Um, he's, everyone probably understands he's German. Uh, he's born in Kuz, which is near Trier. But here is, uh, here's an example of the kind of thing that he's doing. So Gutenberg is c contemporaneous, exactly. Mm -hmm. And Gutenberg is in Mainz, um, in, I guess it's like southeastern Germany. I, 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 my, my geography is not all that good. But he, um, and my German pronunciation is worse, so <laughs> give, me, give me a break. But Sounds he, like you need a trip to Germany. <laughs> hey, <laughs> right, send me over. The, uh, anyway, Gutenberg is right at the time when Kuz's Who's is holding synods, they're called, S-Y-N-O-D-S, S-Y-N-O-D-S. A synod is like a meeting of all the church, church fathers of the area. And he brings people together, and, he's, and he rails at them. We have to reform the church. You, we have to get rid of this corruption. We have to, you know, we have to make this, we have to turn this into, our people into, into real human beings. Because Kuza comes out of the Brotherhood of the Common Life, which is a mass education movement. It's a, it's a mass public education movement. The Brotherhood of the Common Life, they're recruiting talented people, talented children from impoverished families, and they're saying, come and live with us, and we're going to teach you a Renaissance, uh, a Renaissance education. Well, this is like in, enlisting uh, the, clerk, uh, the clergy. Yeah, that's actually not to create clergy. It's not a brotherhood, like, uh, like a Francis, the Franciscans and the Dominicans. It is something different. It's like a social movement. Oh. It's more like LaRouche's youth movement, which is you're bringing people, except specifically you're going to like poor families in the 14, 1400s, early 1400s. It actually starts in the, in the 1370s. Um, oh my God. <laughs> and so they start, they start bringing people in, and, they, and the idea is mass education. What was Gutenberg interested in? Mass education. That's the point of this of this whole operation, I believe. I'm not an expert on Gutenberg either, but I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. One of the things that you need if you're going to standardize and reform the church is you need standard Bibles. At this point, everyone has different kinds of Bibles. Okay. Right? They have, you know, different translations, you know, etc., cobbled together, blah, blah, blah. So this is just an example of what Kuz is doing. Kuz, in fact, there's even a potential that Kuz may have made one of the first orders, uh, you know, like um, to, to, to Gutenberg as a printer. One of the very first orders using Gutenberg's printing press. And there's, it's a possibility, this is, you know, basically, it's basically fantasy because there's no way of knowing. But he could have, that he would have ordered um, indulgences because they printed indulgences that were like uh, bonds in a sense that you would, 
you would sell indulgences to raise money for the church. And the indulgence basically says, it's like a get out of jail free cards for your sins, you know? <laughs> because you're doing something good for the church, therefore you get a modicum of, uh, of you know, of um, forgiveness. Yeah, dispensation, right. Anyway, so it's kind of funny, but I think that's, okay. Anyway, so Gutenberg was doing this kind of thing. So was Kuza. Oh, this is cool. This is the Gutenberg Bible it, from um, the New York Public Library. It, it's there right now today. It was brought to the United States by a guy named James Lennox in 1847. Anyway, so, so these things lasted pretty good. You know, actually, something else so interesting is that the size of the book and the size of the print on the page is exactly the golden ratio. It's a golden rectangle. What do you mean? It's you know the the like the like the the, the when the when the Greeks built their uh, built their uh, oh, their beautiful the architecture they built it according to certain to the golden ratio a certain standard of beauty. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? I, I don't know, but what do you mean the print like the like the, the ratio of the 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 right. length of the print versus the width? Yeah. And the ratio of the width of the book versus the length is both in, apparently I've read this I'm, I'm you know. What I believe, that's what I've read. Anyway, so, oh, there's a beautiful picture of Brixton. He ends up in Brixton. Kuzo, he's sparking along the way. Let me make further points on this mass education idea. When Kuzo walks into a little town, he comes into the town and he starts giving sermons. And he starts, and, he, and he's, he's pulling people and he's giving a sermon like every day. You know, he's doing an, an, an incredible amounts of. Um, of, uh, of work, um, doing the, the types of prayers that he's, he's getting people to, like, for example, pray allegiance to the, to the Pope. He wants to unify the church. He wants them to see themselves as part of the whole Roman church. But more importantly, what he's doing is he goes in every town and he puts up on the wall what's called a wall catechism, I think. Yeah, wall catechism. What's this? It's prayers and the Ten Commandments, and associated, uh, you know, and the Nicene Creed, in German, on the wall, for the first time in the vernacular. Because he's part of this mass literacy movement. Why, you know, people want, need to know how to read, they need to have a language. This is a nation, you have to pull them together and give them an identity. Okay, and he's really a stickler. There's, there's reports that he goes into certain towns, and, uh, and he says, at this point he's a cardinal, and, they, and he says, um, um, let me see, who's controlling, who's got the key to your poor box? <laughs> who's got the key to your money? And, he's, and he decides who should hold the key. Or he goes down to people, and you have to bury, you have to bury uh, people, uh, corpses, at least seven feet underground. So he goes and he says, where's your measuring stick? And yeah, he makes sure that they have their oh measuring stick. All these, like, he's down to the, the minu minu minutia, right? Anyway, he ends up in Brixen, and he has this huge conflict with this guy, Duke Sigismund. Uh, the, er the region is called Tyrol, or Tyrol, or whatever, however you pronounce it. And, um, it's around the Swiss mountains? Yeah, Austria? yeah. It's modern day Austria. Oh. But, um, and, uh, anyway. He has a huge conflict with the oligarchs in this region. In fact, this guy tries to kill Kuza, and he throws him in jail. Because Kuza is trying to pull together the whole operation. He's trying to pull together the whole region around a, a centralized. He's trying to establish, he's working on this kind of idea of pulling together a government that actually works. It actually has a divine, uh, you know, divine authority, as he describes in Concordantia uh, Catholica, Concordantia Catholica. Okay, so there's more to be said on that, but I'm going to skip over it. Um, there's something else that's happening. Let me go back to this. There's something else that's happening. In something like 1450, what's that? Congress is finding America. That's, that's, okay, we're going there. That's exactly where I'm taking us. Well, Kuz is taking us. You're right on the money. 
We're going exactly, we're doing that. That's where we're going. That's what his death is about. Okay, it's about the founding of America. You're going to find out. But in the meanwhile, well, Kuza has a beautiful vision of what, of, and it's a, it's, a, it's a real idea. He creates the idea, it exists, the nation state. He creates an idea of modern science, boom, it exists. <laughs> meanwhile, there's political, strategic things taking place. Okay, what's happening? The Turkish Empire is rising, the Ottoman Empire. In 1451, I believe, Mehmet II takes over. He's 19 years old. Mehmet II, he decides we're going to take Constantinople. Finally, we're going to get in there and we're going to take Constantinople. Remember, the Byzantine Empire had been a vast region around Constantinople. By this time period, by the 1450s, it was basically limited to a Constantinople itself and a handful of other territories. Relatively small. It wasn't really an empire anymore. Nevitt says, Constantinople, we're going to take it. It's going to be ours. So in 1452, he takes Constantinople. It takes about seven weeks. Seven or eight weeks, it's a siege. And uh, the reports in the West are horrifying. It's like ISIS. They're saying things like, they walk in, they, the Turks are walking in, the Ottomans are walking into Constantinople and they're killing man, women, and child. Indiscriminately. The, 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 the steep roads of Constantinople are flowing with blood. Hmm. Mehmet gives his soldiers the right, the, the sort of traditional right, three days to loot the city. And for three days there's no laws. The Ottoman Empire, Ottoman uh, soldiers can come in and they can loot whatever the hell they want. Constantinople is still a really advanced city, very beautiful city. It's the location of the largest, the largest church before, if I'm, if I'm correct, I think it is, the largest, most beautiful building before Brunelleschi's dome, the Hagia Sophia. The Hagia Sophia is a is a dome, it, the outside is not all that beautiful, the inside is incredibly beautiful. It's a dome, it's a massive dome. It's an it's a, it's a Orthodox Christian um, cathedral. This is what this Hagia Sophia looks like today, because it's been Muslim ever since. He took it over, they changed everything, that's what it looks like today. It's still, of course, extremely beautiful. Um, but this is bad stuff. This is bad news. Kusa gets word of this. And he decides to write something about it. So within a matter of weeks, no, not weeks, months, it's probably September that he writes it, if I remember correctly. I used to have this stuff at my fingertips, but I haven't really refreshed myself. But it must be September. He writes, to, uh, he writes a document called On the Peace of Faith. And in it he begins, he says, I, I, hearing about the atrocities committed by the Turks, I've been in a terrible state. I've been, I can't think of anything else. For a whole, for a whole week, I've been consumed by my, by my deep, you know, my deep pain and, 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 and uh, despair for the <coughs> what's happened. Bless him. And then, he says, and then I had a vision. And here was my vision. He had a vision that in heaven there was a council. Every nation had a representative. Every different religion had a representative, from the Chaldeans to the, you know, to the Jews, to the to the Muslims, to the to the uh, the Christians, and all other all these other sects. So heaven is on First Avenue in the forties. <laughs> <laughs> Must be a penthouse. <laughs> so. He had a vision that they were having a council. And uh, um, in this council, God was there, and Peter, St. Peter was there, and Christ is there. And the document is a dialogue. And in the dialogue, his reaction to this incredible terrorist violence, this apocalyptic destruction, as he can see it, I don't really, it's not entirely clear that that's actually what happened in Constantinople. 
It's not entirely clear that the Ottomans were really that vicious. But certainly the reports in the West were that it was really terrible. Okay, so his response to these reports is to say, all the, all the religions, he creates a dialogue, it's a beautiful dialogue to read, very readable. All the religions depend on the idea of one God. All of them de depend on the idea of one true God, whether you realize it or not. If we all agree on that, then we can all agree that we're all God's children. And he works through a process of how we can come to a peace of faith an end to religious warfare. This is like totally remarkable that he would do this. Later on, he is in touch with a friend of his who he met at that same council where he put forth the Catholic Concordance, the Council of Basel, a guy named John of Segovia, who's a Spaniard who understandably has some experience with Islam, right, because of the Moors. And they talk about the idea of having a conference of having a conference of learned Muslims, of learned Christians, and bring them all together and figure it out. Come up with a peace. So that's the kind of thing that Kuz is working on during this time period. Okay. So, let me bring it together at this point. What I want you to imagine is the idea here. Uh, here's the strategic universe, basically this, right? I could zoom it out a little bit and we'd see it a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, basically that, let's call it. This is the strategic universe for these people at the time. This is what they know of. There's knowledge, you know, there's, there's knowledge that there's other stuff going on. It's known that there's a civilization in China. There's very little contact. Uh, what did they decide to do? Kuza, he's, he knows that we have to found this nation state concept. We have to bring it into existence. We have to establish a divine government, and it only is divine if it has the consent of the, of the, of the governed. Right? He knows that we have to create a system where mankind can free himself of the shackles of sense perception of Aristotle. He's been fighting Aristotle like that. Remember, Aristotle is the one who says, some people are born to be slaves, and some people are born to be masters, and that's how the world is. Kuzu says, that's crap. That's crap. I'm not going to take it. So he's in dialogue for many decades of his life, but in particular in the last period of his life where he's based in Rome. Because eventually in the, last, in the last years of his life, he goes back to Rome. After all that problem, in, uh, you know, with uh, Duke Sigismund, he goes to Rome. And, okay, now here's Brixen. See it in, I guess, in, yeah, it's, it's right up there in northern Italy, in fact. Anyway, so it goes from Brixen down to Rome. And he, um, and he's working with, Pope, uh, Pope, uh, Pope uh, Piccolomini. And okay, what, what are they working on? At the same time, he's been talking with Toscanelli. That's what I was going to say. For decades, he's been working with Toscanelli. Toscanelli is the most uh, respected mathematician of the time period. He's known across Italy, across Europe. Pope Piccolomini is trying to prepare for a crusade against the Ottomans. The Ottomans are coming up into Europe. There's been a major problem in this area of the, uh, of the world uh, with the Ottomans. They're advancing, there's been wars, there's been deaths. One of Cusa's closest um, supporters, a guy named Cesarini, is killed in one of the crusades that takes place here in the mid-14... Late, late 1440s, I think. Anyway, over this whole time period, right? There's all this, there's all this conflict. It's terrible. And so, Piccolomini says, we're going to have to have a war. We're going to have to finally confront this. We're going to have to force the Ottomans out. Otherwise, they're going to take us over. 
That's what he thinks the strategic, the strategic scenario is. Okay? We're going to have to have a conflict between these two major powers. Okay, well that sounds familiar. <laughs> who, is, who, is, who is conducting this? Who is, who is, who is marionetting it? The Venetians. The Venetians have territory all across here, and of course Venice up here. Is the Venetian flag? They have territory down to uh, you know down down here to. Is that is that Crete? Yeah, that's Crete. And uh, Greece. And there's Greece, of course. And anyway, so they have territory across the area. What is Venice? Venice is a financial empire. And they're the in-between, between the West, between Rome and, and Constantinople, between Rome and the Ottomans, is Venice. Venice has been doing everything possible to put off a war. They've been trying to hold up and prevent the war from happening yet. Because they figure the longer they can put it off, the better they'll be able to control it. Okay? 18, I mean, excuse me, 1464, let me just bring it to the, to the conclusion here. 1464, here they are in Rome. This is, uh, this is, this is Cusa's cathedral in Rome that he's in charge of as a cardinal. San Pietro in, in Vincoli, St. Peter in Chains. He leaves Rome. With him, Toscanelli, and a figure, uh, well, he also one, one of his secretaries, the guy who brought the, print, the printing press to Italy, and then a figure named, um, oh gosh, his name is escaping me. Check my notes. Oh yeah, okay. So the 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 uh, the, the secretary is a guy named Debussy, and then a guy named Fernando Martin. This guy is very important, although you may not seem so at first. They leave Rome. They're going to Ancona. Why are they going to Ancona? Look at that. It's beautiful. They're not going for the resort. <laughs> They're going to meet the Venetian Doge. The Doge is the head of the Venetian oligarchy. The Doge is bringing many ships to prepare for a war. Because Piccolomini is saying, we got to have the war. Piccolomini has been organizing conferences to get people to say, OK, I'll give you some of my people. I'll give you some soldiers. I'll give you some soldiers. We'll put together a force. We'll stop the Ottomans once and for all. Piccolomini says, I don't know. This seems to be the only way to deal with the problem. I don't know any other way to do, do, deal with it. He should have listened to Kuzo, right? But instead, he says, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with, and we're going to go, and we're going to meet with the Doge. And the Doge is going to provide the ships, and we're going to get moving on this. That's where they're going. Piccolomini is sick. Cusa is sick. But they're going anyway. OK. Here's the picture of Cusa that's in like a who's who of the 1490s. They, they published a book where they did little pictures of all the famous people in the, in the world. And Cusa's picture is in there. So this is a picture from like the 1490s. Anyway, so there he is. He's in his cardinal's his cardinal's gear. That's a cardinal's red hat and so forth. In Todi, T O D I, Cusa takes ill, and he dies. There to sign his death certificate, again Toscanelli, Fernando Martin. Meanwhile, three days later, Piccolomini. In Ancona, he dies. The whole situation with the Venetian Doge, the whole intention of getting this crusade going, it was a failure anyway because Piccolomini could barely get any troops together. So he's really screwed himself. And, and, and he, it's over. But ask yourself, what were they talking about? What were they thinking about? Here is what Piccolomini said about the Venetians. Long before, decades before, here's what he said. As among brute beasts, aquatic creatures have the least intelligence, so 
among human beings, the Venetians are the least just and the least capable of humanity. They please only themselves, and while they talk, they listen to and admire themselves. When they speak, they think themselves sirens. They wish to appear Christian before the world, but in reality they never think of God. And except for the state, which they regard as a deity, they hold nothing sacred. The Venetians aim at dom dominion of Italy and all but desire to the mastery of the world. These are the people he goes to for help. Imagine what kind of a situation he's in. He's compromising with the devil. So think about what Kuz is talking about with Toscanelli. Who is Toscanelli? Toscanelli made the map. The map that was given to Columbus. What was Cusa talking about with Toscanelli? What was he talking about with Fernando Martín? Fernando Martín is a Portuguese... Boom! Boom! Now we can't... We, we can't get... We can't get anything going in the strategic situation here. We have to create a new strategic situation. We have to create a new system. We have to expand this whole operation. This civilization project, we're going to win, goddammit, but it's not going to happen here. We have to go and we have to do something else. So we need to go across the ocean. So we need to go across the ocean. Gotta go to the moon. Gotta go to the moon. Gotta go across the ocean. Fernando Martin, very important, he's a canon, that is to say a church official, at the cathedral at Lisbon. He's a Portuguese. Portuguese. Okay? They are the navigators, right? Fernando Martin is in dialogue with Columbus and puts Toscanelli in touch with Columbus. Columbus takes his map from Toscanelli and he gets the idea, we're going to cross the ocean, we can go east by going west. Mm -hmm. Right? See what I'm saying? They're going to get to Asia by, go by going west. Get to the Indies or and so forth. Okay. That's what Kuz's death is about. It's about creating a new world. He is 63 when he dies. And he's traveled incredible thousands of miles. Thousands of miles. Doing all kinds of remarkable things. He's written so many treatises and sermons, forget about it, incredible numbers of sermons. And he's famous, he's very well known. He's very well known. Cusa's work then is passed around at the schools where, for example, where Kepler is studying as a young man. And Kepler reads Cusa's document. We expect that he must have read the Dr. Ignorantia on the basis of what he says, Kepler says in it, this is 150 years after Cusa. But he must have read Cusa because he quotes Cusa in one of his first books. So, <coughs> okay, so now here's the fun part. Let me, here's the coda, okay, here's a little, here's a little afterthought. And uh, this gives, this is just kind of fun. It's sort of from a different, track from, uh, from the current way I'm doing the class, but this is some fun about how these things get destroyed. Because here's the funny thing. Um, we are taking back Europe, right? We did it through the process of the American Revolution. But we're taking back Europe as part of Eurasia today. The only future for Germany modern-day Germany, the only future for modern-day Italy is the Eurasian land bridge. And Helga Zeppelin-Russ just got massively broadcast in China. If that's what they're doing publicly, Helga, ask yourself what they're doing privately. Ask yourself what kind of meetings she's having, what kind of discussions she's having with leading Chinese economic thinkers. Okay? And she is doing, with Lyndon's leadership, what Cusa did. Yeah, I mean, really think about that, because Lyndon's not going to be alive when we're mining helium-3. 
unless somehow he lives to be like 140, <laughs> or you know, 100. And, I mean, not 140, but 120 or 115 or something like that. But uh, he's not going to be around. One person did. Uh, he could do it. He could, if anyone could do it, he could do it. But uh, <laughs> he's probably not going to be around. Just like Kuzo was not around in 1492. Three elements, right? But Kuzo was not around in 1492. Kuzo had been dead for 30 years when we landed in the New World, when Columbus landed in the New World. Okay, so how are these things taken from us? This is an afterthought. It's kind of funny. It's not so as relevant as it was when I did this class eight weeks ago. But I'm going to include it anyway because it's kind of fun. All right. So we're going to bring Kuzo back. Let me just lay it out like that. We're going to bring Kuzo back. We're going to do it. I want to urge everyone. Uh, Kuza's material is extremely accessible online. There's a, there's a good guy named Jasper Hopkins. Jasper Hopkins, he wrote, he, he's done a ton of translations of Kuza. And if you just Google Nicholas of Kuza, Jasper Hopkins, there's a ton of excellent translations done. And then, of course, if you want to hold it up for everyone to see Rod McFarlane, he's got Rod. <laughs> you show people what you got. This is the Kuza book. Most people have it. Those were translations of Nicholas of Kuza into English done by Will Wirtz when Will Wirtz was put in jail for several years with Lyndon LaRouche. Will Wirtz and Lyndon, I believe, were roommates at a certain point in time. And um, In jail? or In jail. At least they were in the same facility. Anyway, so that's who we are. That's what's happening today. This is happening. This is coming into existence. Chang'e 3 is on the moon, right? And Chang, the next Chang'e, uh, the, the, uh, the rover. The next, the, next the next phase of the Chinese space program is going to be an orbiter. In other words, we're gonna, they're going to send up something that's going to go and it's going to orbit the moon and then come back. This is incredible. This is happening right now. It's, we're China. building, China, well, yes, China's doing it, but we're, we're doing it. We are doing it because we're humans. This is a, the, the main thing that's happening is the sparking of creativity. That's what Kuzo's concern was. How do these things get brought down? It's funny. It's amazing. Let me, maybe this is the best way to look at it. It's, it's ridiculous. It's so silly how these things get kept from our people, get kept from us. Here's the story of how Kuzo has been kept from the United States population. Here's the story, all right? Okay. On this, okay, take a look at my map here. I've got Ancona, I've got, there's, there's Istanbul, of course, Constantinople. This is the Hagia Sophia, right? Incredible, beautiful. Let's see, I've got, there's the, uh, there, there's the Santa Maria del Fiore. Okay, let's, let's keep, here's Lisbon. This is where Fernando Martinez, that's the, that's the cathedral of Lisbon. This is the guy who's with Cusa when he, when he dies. That cathedral, I think, is... It's pretty much the same thing. It may not have been finished when he was Liz when he was the canon. Okay, we're going back. We're going back, and we're going. Wait, there's one more location on my map. What is that? It's wait a second. It's New Orleans. Why would I have New Orleans on a map about Cusa? This is bizarre. I don't understand. <laughs> no, the uh, we're zooming in, zooming in on the Crescent City which was my home for a couple of years. Here's this Café du Monde. Ooh, beignets, mm. we can stop for some de beignets. Here's, here, I taught school when I first started reading LaRouche. I was teaching on uh, Bienville Street, and right here next to the cemetery. It's actually, it's a beautiful cemetery. But anyway, I was teaching right here. That's where I was teaching. But guess what? There is a, and I was living somewhere over here. Anyway, this is just, just a little tour of Daniel's life. And then here's a place called Vigneault Street. Look at that. It's just one tiny little block. The street is one block long. Maybe two blocks. Vigneault Street. OK, why is Vigneault Street interesting? Well, the scene is 1862. Okay? What's happening in 1862 in New Orleans? 
Oh, the Civil War. The Civil War. The Union takes New Orleans, the conquest of New Orleans. The Union takes New Orleans in 1862. Famously, Butler is made the basically military dictator of, of the city of New Orleans. And he does a great job, I think. I'm not an expert, but I think he does a good job. There's a man named Henri Vigneault. Henri Vigneault had been a public school teacher in New Orleans, but mostly he was a newspaper man. He was a French speaker. He was part of this slimy, dirty, Confederate, slave-owning, bastard, you know, French-speaking, disgusting slimeball crew that was dominating certain parts of New Orleans, all right? He was with the Confederates. When Butler takes over, for some reason, I think because he was a propagandist, Vigneault, and I have a picture of him, Okay, there's Vigneault. But I gotta, I gotta exit real quick so you don't get the story taken away from me. So he's an old man at that point. But he's a young man in 1862. He gets, he gets the word, Butler's coming to get him. Butler's gonna put you in jail. So he says, oh crap. And he takes 250 bucks, which must have been a huge amount of money at that time. And uh, he bribes someone to get him on to, bribes a guard basically to get him on a, a soldier, to get him on a, on a boat to go to Paris, okay? So he gets on a ship to go to Paris, and he's carrying with him, we don't know all the details, but we know this, he's carrying with him dispatches, letters, for the head of the Confederate Secret Service in Paris. Actually, the diplomatic service it's called, but it's a head of, it's basically the Confederate spy master in Paris, who, uh, who, his name is just escaping me. Um, Gosh, I knew his name, sets with a B. Anyway, uh, but he goes to the, the, the if people know um, uh, Bullock, Bullock was the head of the Secret Serv the Confederate Service in London. This was, uh, oh, Slidell, that's it, Slidell. So I got him Slidell, S-L-I-D-E-L-L. -L. Slidell's the head of the Confederate Secret Service in Paris. And Slidell is doing everything possible at this point to get the French, to get Napoleon III, to recognize the Confederacy as a nation. Because if you can get them to recognize the Confederacy, then the other, the other countries will come in on behalf of the Confederacy and they can destroy the Union. That's the idea, right? So Vigneault gets picked up and he gets sent, he gets sent over there and he comes in the, in the service of these bastards, these evil, traitorous bastards. But then after the war is over, he's been living in Paris, he's a French speaker, uh, for his whole life. After the war is over, about 10 years later, he becomes the chief secretary of the American consulate there. Okay? A traitor who was in the employ of Slidell, a bigger traitor, becomes basically the top man in Paris for the United States government. Not quite. He's like just below, he's not, we don't have an embassy there yet. But, so he's just below the de facto amb ambassador. And many times over the course of his career, he, he serves as the head honcho. During this time, he is collecting a library. The library is full of Christopher Columbus books. He becomes the world's, he has the largest library, effectively, of Christopher Columbus literature. Every, everything he get his hands on. He has so many, so many books he has to purchase a place in the countryside because it's too expensive to keep his library in Paris. For decades he serves as the in this in this position. He's a tre treasonous slave slave owner type. He's a disgusting scum of a person. And you don't like him, do you, Dan? I don't like him. In 1905 he publishes a book. No 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 well actually in 1905 he gets a bunch of credit for it. But in 1900, I forgot. At the same time that Bertrand Russell is holding this big conference in Paris, that same year in Paris, there's a conference of the Americanists. 
which is a grouping of historical historians and so forth who are writing about America. And at this conference in 1900, he puts forth a document claiming that Christopher Columbus was a fake, Columbus was a jerk, etc., and so forth. Columbus was no good. And most importantly, he says that Columbus never, ever talked to Toscanelli. He claims that it's a fake, it's false, it didn't happen. Okay? And one of the key things that he says is Fernando Martin never existed. <laughs> He claims these people basically didn't exist. Here's, here's what it says. Henry Vigneault belittles the story of Columbus. These uh, things like this are all over, the, all over the world, really, but especially in the United States. He becomes famous as the leading Columbus scholar. And what does he say? He says Columbus is a, is a stupid jerk. He didn't even know what he was doing. It was really just by accident that he got to the United States, or got to North America. It's all. Yes. It's important to look at this. I mean, I mean you know, it's really. was searching for somewhere else and just bumped into it. Yeah, he just bumped into it. You know, he claims, uh, oh, well, he was, a, you know, he was a womanizer, he was a cheat, all of these things. Yeah. This is where it comes from. Yeah. This is difficult. This is difficult. Because I remember when I was a public school teacher in New Orleans, I thought that Columbus was a terrible, was terrible. Yes. Got a terrible person. I thought that he had committed terrible crimes, genocide, and so yes. forth. Mm -hmm. But then I, had to, I, I figured this out. I didn't, even, I didn't even try to find this. I didn't even try to find this. I was, just, I was just trying to figure out about who this guy Fernando Martin was that was there when Cusa died. And I read some of our literature, we wrote about this, and I read about this guy, and so I said, okay, let me look into it. And I looked into it, and I kept on searching, and I kept on reading all this stuff about Vigneault, because he got lots of publicity attacking Columbus, right? When he, died, when he retires in 1909, guess who gives him a big retirement bonus? 20,000 at the time is about half a million dollars, and he's given for his excellent service. Guess who gives him the money? Virtually. That's a good guess. <laughs> J.P. Morgan and, and, the the Carnegie. Carnegie. and Carnegie's. Nice choice. Uh, he, okay. he did a good job. He did a good job <laughs> destroying the idea of America, trying to bring down the idea that the United States was founded as part on the basis of an idea of the dignity of man that the reason that Columbus ever even came here was because of the work of Cusa setting out to establish a nation state, mm. setting out to, dis to create a new strategic universe. Yeah. You have to realize it just opened up another line of questioning, which is, uh, I mean, now, now this Morgan, I, I guess that it was Morgan. Yeah. Morgan <laughs> yeah. $20,000. But you open up the question of, the ideological consciousness of Morgan. Now we have the Morgan Library. Yeah. And, well, go on. Yeah. And, and Morgan was a very powerful figure, obviously, and yeah. his influence continues today in a very negative way. So it's it's very interesting that this all of a sudden pops up that Morgan is is totally conscious and aware of Vigneault's uh, campaign against Columbus. Yep. So. I don't even know if any of this has been explored or if anybody's written books on it, uh, the extent of the work. Have you found anything else on uh, a, something like a, a Morgan crusade to, to stifle uh, history, to rewrite history? I think that's a wonderful question. I mean, you have to ask yourself, I, I think you're right, it does raise this question, because if Morgan in this period, if the Morgan House of Morgan is completely aware of this kind of thing, right. then what were they doing with Bertrand Russell? You know what were they? You know what were they doing to what were they doing to destroy science? If they were out to destroy history, right. I mean, destroying Cusa is destroying science. But Morgan tried to destroy Edison, of course. That's a good point. Right, right at this time, Morgan period. tried to destroy Edison. Tried to oh. destroy Edison. Stop him from building the power plants and you know, public electricity and things like that. For people who don't know, basically what happened is that. 
Thomas Edison, after the, you know, building off of the great work going back to Benjamin Franklin, he finally creates the ability to use electricity as a power source, effectively, you know, to, to create a power planet with electricity. And he says, look at what I've done, this is incredible. And J.P. Morgan walks by and they say, oh, this looks great. We'll be happy to give you some funding. You just sign on the dotted line. And so Edison says, OK, give me the funding. He signs it, signs up for it. And they allow him, they give him the funding to build one power plant on Pearl Street in Lower Manhattan. And after that, they give him no more funding, basically. They say, all right, now let's see if it's, if it's viable for the market. And they, and they try to see if, and, and they say, well, that's it. You've got, your, you've got your seed money. Go along. And Edison is stifled completely because of that. And so it takes him, he has to go piece by piece. He goes to municipalities. Edison has to go to municipalities and say, hey, here's a reason why you should build yourself a power plant. I'll, I'll do it for you if you, can, if you can pay for it. And he has to do that. And, and, so, again and, again and, again. and so it's not until the 1930s, it's not until Franklin Roosevelt, that, that power plants, that you know, electricity is actually used for the benefit of the people. Well, not until decades later. That, that's the TDA you're talking about. In partic right? yes, especially. Particularly, yeah, yeah. They had no, no electricity. Otherwise, I mean, obviously you had some progress in the cities, but in terms of a national basis, we're <laughs> using this power of fire. So he stopped it. Uh, so Morgan stopped that intentionally. Jesus. But anyway, I think that's a great question. I don't know. I'd be interested, I mean, of course, at the time, uh, you know, the Morgans are, they're, the ma they're part of the major synarchist networks, so what they're doing is they're funding fascist, fascist operations across Europe, fascist movements all over, and I'm sure it's not restricted to Europe, but I'm not an expert in any of that. Anyway, any other questions? Or other thoughts? Yeah. Going back to the beginning, you uh, mentioned the... Uh, the, uh, the concept of natural law. Yes. And what? How does one define what a tenet or a principle embodied in natural law is, which requires what was the expression? The consent of the consent of the population. Consent. Of yeah, the, the consent of the government. Yeah, so the idea that. is that there are tenets of natural law that must be uh, agreed upon by the consent of the government whatever that process is, do you have any? I mean, I think the main one is the filioque. I think everything stems from that, because as, well, as long as you, the law of, of God is the law of nature. I mean, consider what he's going up against. What is the, what is the principle of law before Kusa? He is battling against Roman common law. And in Roman law, the conception is the, they, they have a different idea of natural law. For a Roman, natural law is the law of the jungle. They say the state of nature, the real state of mankind, is one of constant war and aggression. And so for them, natural law is like, it's like the confederacy. It's the law of, it's the law of ownership. It's the law, you know what I mean? That's, that's to them what's nature. And it's the same thing with Hobbes later. It's the same thing with all the Brits. Same idea, principally. So he's saying, no, natural law is not, it's not that. Natural law is something that has to do with the harmony of the universe. And so therefore, not ownership the most property. important, what's that? Not ownership of property. Yeah, it's not about ownership of property. It's about the nature of mankind and the role of mankind in the universe. And the most important thing there is the filioque. The most important thing is that mankind be the filioque. Let me turn this off and we'll use the black board. We have any pens? No, but we don't. No. You mind checking next door? Yeah. Thank you, friends. Be, or actually, remember the last time we found it in the camp. Um, the most important, the most important thing is that man is a co-creator. You have to create. In other words, the principle of energy flux density, of continual progress in man's understanding of the universe and man's power over the universe. You go back to Genesis: be fruitful and multiply. That's what I'm talking about. That's natural law. Natural law is progression. And if you want to know that that's natural law, all you've got to do is study the evolution of the biosphere. 
and the way that all creatures go from less complex, less advanced, to more and more advanced over time. Thank you. That's weird. Yeah, these are, it's okay. Let me throw these out. You see any more. Anyway, so does that make sense? Natural law is, and if that's, that, that's the ultimate principle, then everything stems from that. It all goes from there because you ask yourself, okay, well, how do, what's the law of education then? How should we make laws about education? Well, they have to be according to actually developing people to become geniuses because every one of them can be. Well, what's the law about warfare? Well, if, if, all, if all people are, have the divine seed within them, then the law of warfare has to be no warfare uh, between nation states, you know, unless it's a police action, unless it's to stop some kind of genocide, or some type of whatever. Yeah? So, with proper guidance and proper orientation, uh, I I interpret what you were saying as meaning that man approximates God and is, is, a, is continually in a process of getting closer and closer to these ideals which one can define as God. Is that correct or not? I'm trying to think very specifically about what you're saying. I mean, it is the case that man, think of it, I would say go to Leibniz. Go to Leibniz. Go to, go to the Declaration of Independence. It's the pursuit of happiness. If you understand what happiness is, Okay, then you'll understand what this is. Unfortunately, that's not, that's not a dry erase marker. Um, but here. If you understand what happiness is, then you'll understand what progress is. Happiness is, this is how you spell failure. Point. Happiness is discovering mankind's, discovering the universe, discovering God's universe, for the benefit of others. Leibniz writes a beautiful piece called On Felicity that is about happiness. And that's, if you understand that that's happiness, then you understand that, yeah, we're constantly going, we're constantly in a process of self-perfection. But I, I, I don't know that it is to say towards a certain ideal. I, um, Unless you're calling sort of like the good an ideal. Yeah. So yeah. These uh, principles, the principles that you're really referring to. Yeah. I think I think we should, we can take a best uh, probably the best way I I, I can imagine to, to ask that question is to look at what Lynn's been saying about helium three. In other words, you're in progress towards a state of greater learned ignorance, as Kuzu would say. You're in progress to discover more and more what it is that you don't know discover what really what questions really do you need to ask. So you take as a definition of God the ultimate thing that's out there but is never attained but always you're in a greater state of approximation to. Uh, now I feel like you're pinning me down. I'm not I, to pin down. No, 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 I know you're not. I know you're not trying to. I'm just saying um, the what I would urge you to do, what I in response, my best my best response would be to take a look at a couple of specific uh, things that Kuza writes to get a sense of, because I have to ask myself the same question. He writes an incredibly difficult dialogue called On the Not Other, where he says, uh, On the Not Other, or maybe On Not Other, depending on how you translate it. And <laughs> It's a way of trying to figure out the quintessential nature of things. And I think if you want to know what mankind must be in pursuit of, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to do it through this form of dialogue. You see what I mean? It's gonna it's gonna take something like that. You said that one of the fundamental things about Kusa is that he doesn't say that God is up there and you know and there's this big gap. He says that man is some kind of an intermediary. Right. So doesn't that suggest that that as man becomes better and better and improves and assuming that he's oriented in correct direction, 
that he gets higher and higher to that yeah. ultimate. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, you, you brought up this uh, sermon that Kuzma had where he's discussing the idea that, of the Christ within. Yes. And that's a really interesting concept because he's not saying God or Christ or God or the Spirit comes through Christ as something distant or separate from you. I'm saying Christ is within you. That's a really important concept, actually. Yeah. It's not just that the Holy Spirit flows through Christ, who is, you know, man or God, but it's also within you. That means it's a real different concept. I was thinking of this Greek term, which we use all the time, which comes from Greek words, which is enthusiasm. <laughs> and the root, the root of the Greek word roots for enthusiasm is the God within. Mm -hmm. I think I, I'll, yeah. that, that, I think that's a great that's that's a great response. I, I mean I would I, I these are the, these are in other words the reason I'm kind of hesitant is that these are the great questions these are the questions that, that, that have to be pondered and um, yeah so I think you I think you've identified the, the question in other words and that's the first thing to do. Um, I would suggest that we close up at this point unless there's any other burning questions. Or comments. Uh, what book is not other? He has a dialogue called "On the Not Other," which, okay. which, it's, um, it's not really all that significant. Uh, maybe I can do a class on it another day. Okay. Uh, okay. I will want a class on this again. Oh. You enjoy it's it? Really it's a very, it's a very challenging it's thing true. to think about. Okay, I'm going to give Eugene the last question, and then we're going to move on. Could Could you say that that happiness? is like a perfection in man's spirit. In other words, there are no flaws in his spirit, in his mood. And if one is unhappy, it, it's like a flaw, a defect in, in his happiness. And the, the most powerful flaw of unhappiness, I guess, would be to be miserable, you know, then one is not happy at all. Could, could you think of it that way? Uh, when you're putting into my mind, when you're putting into my mind, and I want to return to this because this is like one of my big things, all right, is when you're talking about miserable, you're talking about all of the people and the children on the planet who literally do not have enough to eat, who don't have modern sanitation. Yeah. Literally over a billion people, as you know, as you I know. No expectation of having a good So what I'm saying is that's. Let me return to my initial point. This has changed. The, the, this has changed. We are committing ourselves to crushing the British Empire. The happiness that one must feel if you are eight years old and you're living in a small village in India and you find out that the Prime Minister has said that he is going to build a new city 20 miles from your house where right now there's nothing, there's a swamp. Or you find out that they're going to build a sewer system for your village and you're going to have indoor plumbing. Then all of a sudden you are lifted out of misery. And you can begin to pursue happiness which before was basically not available to you because you're living in squalor. It's just hard. Miserable. In, in misery, hard. exactly. And that's what they, what, what is the, uh, you know, what, what is the British idea that, that, that basically most people's lives are nasty, brutish, and short? That's what they would like. Uh, that's what the British oligarchy wants. We are no longer in a world governed by the British Empire. There's a new system coming into existence and we're in an incredible moment of tension where either we're going to win and crush Obama and fire Boehner and crush the British Empire with, four, with LaRouche's four laws or something else entirely is going to happen which is most likely going to be the World War III scenario. So that's where we are. Think about that.
Yeah, yeah, well, time to think about it. It's unthinkable. Okay, that's, okay. Yeah, so let me just take a poll real quick. Did people get to, um, who here was able to listen to Jeff Steinberg's Thursday Night Report? Okay, a number of people were. And was anyone here able to see the webcast of last night? Okay, okay so it looks like a handful of people. All right, let me say at the outset just that now's the proper time to get yourself programmed to get to get to these webcasts on Friday nights. Because remember that Lyndon, of course, he was recovering from a couple of minor surgeries for a while. And so he was not running the webcasts entirely for, uh, you know, several weeks there, I guess maybe five weeks. And uh, now Lyndon is back in the driver's seat for these webcasts. So that last night was the first webcast in a long time where it was just Lyndon responding to questions that were being asked to him by Matt Ogden and Ben Deniston. So it's a good time to get yourself back in the habit of watching these things at 8 p.m. Or everyone here knows the conference code, the conference call line. You can call in on Friday night at 8 p.m. and listen to it live by your telephone if you're, no, if you're not planning to use the computer. So in other words, just like Thursday night, you call. Use the, the access code? Same access code, same story entirely. But you don't need the, uh, but you have to. It's like, it's just like a thousand number, don't you? First? Yeah, exactly. You call the 424 number, you put in the same access code from Thursday night, but of course the activist call is at 9 p.m., whereas the webcast is at 8 p.m. So I just want to make that request that people, well, urge you to. And if you need it, I'll definitely put it on the board before we leave. I think everyone's, everyone's probably gotten it from us 18 times, but. Don't All right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. No reason not to. No reason not to. Anyway, okay. So, um, I, I I really like this this setup. This question of um, what is it that uh, um, what is it that your principled actions can do into the future, and what defines a principled action? What is a creative action? How can you actually create the future? Okay, that's what Kuza was talking about. That's what he was thinking about. That's what his life was about. That's what he did. Uh, I've done two classes on Kuza. One of them was the one I did most recently, where I had all the Aristotle quotes. And people were here for that. I think, you know, I guess the good one, no, uh, the other one was uh, the first one I did. I started with the map, and I showed his whole uh, the first half of his life up to about 1440. People remember that, and I was talking about the Turks, and I was talking about the uh, the Venetians, and so forth. It was in that spot on the Lower East Side, or not Lower East Side, but um, you know, it was like Murray Hill kind of area. Yeah. Anyway, so I I on that day I only got through about half of Kuz's life. Today I'm going to finish the second half of Kuz's life, and I want it to be used. You know, I want you to think about it from the standpoint of this new situation that we're in. Because you kind of have to drop everything that you thought about this movement. You kind of have to stop it, stop thinking that way. And I mean it from this standpoint. We have been, imagine, imagine those of you who signed up with us uh, under Bush, for example. Imagine what we were doing. We were calling out to people, hello, the system's about to blow. Hello, you know, look at how comments from um, the vice president of Bolivia. I think his name is Linera. Okay, keep in mind the context. For decades now, Bolivia has been a discuss, you know, I mean, they've been taken over by environmentalists. They've been taken over by the Greenies, by the Ga Gaia, Mother Earth. Okay, that's where they've been for decades. They've been in backwards. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that in that part of South America, the environmentalist tendency is very strong. But okay. This book, How That's Frank, um, I forget the name of the guy who wrote it. It's called um, uh, Confessions of a 
economic, economic hitman. Economic hitman. Yeah. Perkins. Huh? Perkins. Per yeah. Perkins. John Perkins. John Perkins. He describes what they did to yeah. South America. Yeah, Bolivia has been destroyed by the IMF, by the World Bank, by the World, by the uh, British Empire. But it's part of the, what I'm trying to set you up, what I'm trying to set you up for is that the vice president said some, some remarkable things this week, and they go completely against what Bolivia had been saying in recent decades. So listen to this. Oh. Some recent remarks of the Vice President of Bolivia, who, um, uh, just to set up the context for his remarks, you've been stressing that China is taking the lead in developing high energy flux density, setting the standard for the world today, for mankind. And that any nation that wants to survive has to go by China's lead on this issue. Um, and this was very clearly reflected in the remarks of vice, the Vice President of Bolivia, who he made yesterday, where he explicitly invoked the concept of Prometheus. Why not? And Prometheus' fire in announcing Bolivia's decision to go further ahead with nuclear power. Um, this comes in the wake of uh, the context of meetings between uh, Putin and the President of uh, Bolivia. Uh, the sidelines of the BRICS summit recently, and also meeting with uh, the president of China recently. But uh, Vice President uh, Linera Garcia of Bolivia had the following to say yesterday. Here's excerpts from this speech. He said, nuclear power is the fire of the 20th and 21st centuries. It is the fire which our ancestors had 20,000 years ago, which allowed them to make philosophy technical science, culture, and agriculture. Knowledge of the atom, its regularities, its use, its functioning, is the touchstone of the 20th and 21st centuries. The fundamental core of new knowledge and new technologies, new theories and new means of production. Bolivia cannot remain on the periphery if this is the case. If knowledge of the atom is the sacred fire of the 20th and 21st centuries, as fire was for the pre-agriculture civilizations of 20,000 years ago, today, a society which is respected, and we respect ourselves, cannot remain on the periphery, and we are not going to remain on the periphery. Let us break the mental and colonial chains. Break them. Let us then you, I have in my mind an image of a globe, like when you see the, the Earth from space at night. And as the world is turning, you see the lights from the cities across the world are sparkling, right? And they gradually light up across the whole, the whole globe. And you can see that, that 3D image, right? Everyone's seen something like that before. Yeah. Imagine that in your mind, but every single one of those lights is the mind of a young person that has all of a sudden been sparked into existence because of this strategic alliance that is now taking place. It's happening now. It's happened in the past six weeks. It's happening now. Rapid shift. So take that into your heart. Take that into your mind for a moment. That's the new strategic situation. The world is defined by the miracle of creativity that is currently taking place across the world. So when you ask yourself, do we have enough power to do what we need to do? Do we have the means to accomplish what we need to accomplish? Forget it. Forget it. We have an almost unlimited resource in the creativity being sparked by those young people, in those young people across the world. All right? Therefore, the problem that we must commit ourselves to of taking care of the U.S. government becomes of a slightly different nature. It becomes something where people who are thinking strategically are aligning themselves, they have a choice. Continue with make-believe or live in reality. 
and key strategic thinkers in the United States, specifically as Scott referenced in the retired military and the retired intelligence, are beginning to say to themselves, and say directly to Jeff, as a conduit to Lynn, my God, LaRouche has got it. This is it. Helium-3, that's the way. Key bankers in Texas, and I expect that this is related to the Federal Reserve System, have positioned themselves strategically on the basis of the reality that the value system defined by the Wall Street dollar is no longer significant. And that any value system today derives its value relative to the Chinese helium-3 fusion lunar program. The only way to judge the value of what your economy is doing is by looking at the Chinese and seeing how your plan is compared to theirs. That's how the new system of value works. It's by, and as, as Scott ended with, you, it means you have to figure out what are the big questions we haven't been asking yet. What new questions arise from this? So consider that as sort of like the unfolding reality today, and I want to give you the deeper historical understanding of how we came here, and how it could be that ideas move history, and not what we were taught in school, which is that, you know, a handful of people decide history, or mass movements decide history, whatever. No, it's ideas, okay? Nicholas of Cusa. Everyone here has gotten some amount of Cusa from me. I hope. This band, we're collapsing, and mostly what you ran into was people walking around in a day saying, what? The economy's doing fine. Or, you know, what? You know, like, you know, I know things are bad, but they're not that bad. Surprise. Right? Okay. All right. <laughs> and that's just symptomatic of what we were doing, what we've been doing for 50 years since the assassination of John Kennedy. Which is to say, stopping doing everything possible to stop a collapse. Okay? So we're kind of like pushing... No, stop. We're trying to wake people up. Hey, we're falling in, yeah, yeah, we're falling into the right into the pit. Wake up. Things are different now. Things are massively different now. Because the world is being born. The new world is being born. We're in the birth pangs right now. The new world economic order is defined by the BRICS. It's defined by China, it's defined by Russia, most importantly, it's defined by Lin. Okay? This is happening. And it's happening quickly, so it's easy to miss it. But it's happening. Return to the Egypt question. August 5th, Al Sisi gives a press conference. We're going to double the size of the Suez Canal. This had been discussed before. But he says, we're going to do it. And then he says, you know, we, 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 originally we thought this was going to take us three years. Well, I've decided we're going to do it in one year. Ooh. And like, like Scott said, within a week, you have 7,000 people working on it. That's quick, right? That is really quick. That is incredibly quick. You're talking about taking a canal that's been around for over 100 years and finally expanding it. That's incredible. Okay, so just consider that. It's happening right now. If you listen to what Cristina Fernandez has been saying, she should be shot for all of these things. You would, in other words, what I mean is, you would expect to yourself, only someone who was ready to be assassinated would say those things out loud. <laughs> She's really begging for a bullet to be put through her head British, yeah. from the British, right? But she's doing it. I remember a year ago when we were doing a bunch of the stuff on Kennedy, and I was reading Kennedy's speeches and I was saying, oh my god, I had no idea he said this. I can't believe that he attacked Malthus in a speech about science. He said that, he said that environmentalism was crap. Oh my god, of course they killed him. There was, he said two months before 
before he was killed that we should turn the space program into a collaborative effort, a collaborative effort with Russia, with the Soviet Union? <laughs> of course he's, that's incredible, I can't even believe he said that. And, okay, and the same, same feeling that you have about that is what you should be having about what these, what these presidents are saying, what these people are saying. Let me make the point by playing a little bit from the webcast last night. I'm going to play one question and answer. Uh, is, I know that's small. Is that high enough for people to see? Yeah, I'll put it. I'll put another book. This question has dare to leave the cave as our ancestors did 20,000 years ago. Let us dare to assume our responsibility before the world, before our history and our society. Knowledge of nuclear energy is, is knowledge of the ABCs of nature. We have the technical, scientific, and moral obligation to take responsibility for the knowledge, use, understanding, and beneficial development of this fundamental force of nature. It doesn't matter how long it takes. We are going to do it because we are convinced that that is how we cement the conditions for the technological development of Bolivians for the next four to five hundred years. So in line with your remarks, I would like okay. to hear your very, sim that. very simply stated. There is the history of Prometheus. And Prometheus was an actual person. How, how, what form he was an actual person, we're not always quite sure. But the point was that he, that is the case. All right, Prometheus is the principle. And that's the way to look at it. Prometheus is the expre expression of Prometheus. The expression of it. And that's what the difference is between mankind and everything else in the universe. So I just wanted to show that, first of all, to show you what, how excited Lynn is on, about what's going on here. He has every reason to be. But imagine that the vice president of Bolivia is saying, is talking about Prometheus. Mm -hmm. And when he's talking about Prometheus, he's talking about nuclear power. So what is the potential of the BRICS nations coming together? It's that figures, heads of state in South America all of a sudden are talking like LaRouche. If Cristina Fernandez has been talking like John Kennedy, then that guy, Linero Garcia, was definitely talking like LaRouche. So what I'm saying is, this is already happening. And that's a big psychological shift. Your identity may have been, up to this point, stop the collapse. Just hold off the collapse. We can, you know, if we get things realigned, we can do, do something about this. What I'm saying is the difference now is that the new system is coming into being. It is being born as we speak. We have created a mass movement, a global coalition. Imagine in your mind what is happening. If he's saying that, and she is saying what she is saying, President Xi, that is, if Modi is saying what Modi is saying, then they're, they're not just saying that to, like, for us to pick up and print an EIR. I mean, of course, it's not being published, <laughs> not being published in the Post, in the it's Times. not being published in the Times, right? Yeah. So they're not just saying that for our benefit. They're speaking to their people. They're speaking to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of young people. And as this concept of creativity, of fire, of Promethean fire, the principle, LaRouche is saying, of Prometheus, is the leading concept of statecraft, 
in the world defined by the bricks. 